Usually when you are defending your honors thesis, you don't have to remake all of your slides in the 15 minutes before you present your presentation, but we've decided, I guess, to give Maria an extra special challenge today. So if there's any slight thing off on an axis, just forgive her for that. She just remade all of her slides during Miguel's talk. So Maria Hermio is a, um, a neuroscience major who comes from uh, Katy, Texas. Uh, she has a chemistry minor also. Uh, and I think one of the, the ways that I, I, one of the things I really want you to know about her is um, her, her real acumen in predicting uh, NCAA March Madness um, uh, winners. Uh, she is currently the top ranked um, uh, competitor in our Johnson Lab bracket challenge. Uh, and she thinks Carolina is going to take it all away. And I, I agree. So. <laughs> Well, she is first. All right, now Maria has been a peer tutor for integrative um, biology for the past three years, including serving as head peer tutor for two of those years, uh, which means that she's helped teach introductory biology to approximately 25% of the current student body at Trinity. Uh, this is a claim that most of our biology professors can't even make. Uh, also, she's been a peer tutor for the cell systems class and for first year experience. So Dr. King, I think she's almost at tenure by now. <laughs> All right. Can share some space? <laughs> <laughs> now, when Maria started working in the lab, she was interested in studying the brain and the mechanisms of behavior. And I had a little bit of a crazy idea. I wondered if we could study how lizard brains process social information using an approach for molecular biology. And uh, Maria's going to tell you about that, that approach in her, her presentation. Now, I warned Maria that a project like this could be risky. Um, that it would probably be a huge amount of work and that we probably wouldn't get any data that we could use. And I was right about half of that. Uh, it has been a huge amount of work, uh, but Maria did get results and they're incredibly cool. The work she's going to tell you about is her own. She developed the hypotheses and the experimental methodology that she's going to describe. And in addition to this project, she also spent a summer doing field work with our lab in the Dominican Republic. Now, I'm not the only fan of Maria's work. She also received a grant and aid of research from this project from Sigma Xi, the International Honor Society for Science, and she received a Murchison Fellowship for Trinity. She's presented the project she'll tell you about today in a talk at the Texas Herpetological Society last October, and she gave a poster at the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology in New Orleans this past January. Now, Maria is so enthusiastic about Anole Dulaps that she'll talk about them with anybody who will listen. She and Miguel even got this entire group of kids in Santo Domingo to wear Dulaps made out of construction paper. <laughs> you could see Maria over here. Uh, now, this was particularly impressive because this was hands down the world's rowdiest, rambunctious day camp. I mean, these kids were, they had more enthusiasm than Maria did, I guess. Also, uh, Maria and Faith managed to recruit all of the guys in the village of Manuel Goya in the Dominican Republic to be our field assistants for a whole week while we studied an old behavior. So clearly she is really persuasive in her talking about, about D-Labs. Now even if Maria is not so sure about the rest of us, check out, check out her side eye. <laughs> Maria is the heart of our lab, and when she decides which one of the many medical schools that are competing for her is going to win her heart, then she will be an amazing physician. So please join me in welcoming Maria, who will tell us about her work on processing visual and social stimuli in the green and old lizard brain. Dr. Johnson, you're going to make me cry before my author sees this defense. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. I am so excited to share my results with you guys and this journey that has been a two and a half year um, project from start to, to finish. Um, and so, when we're talking about visual and social stimuli, the most logical thing that comes to mind is visual communication. And this is not turning. There we go. Um, visual communication. Animals communicate visually for so many reasons. Um, they could be tr being aggressive towards a predator or towards somebody who's trying to encroach upon their territory. They could be trying to um, court a mate. 
And so here are just a few examples of the many ways that animals communicate visually. But one of the most important parts of that is that when animals are communicating with this visual signal, they're sending a very specific message, and they're sending it in a very specific way. And in animal behavior, we're trying to understand how they're sending it and why they're sending it. And so when you're experimenting with animals, there's a lot of variability because of this communication. If you put two animals in a box, sometimes they're going to fight each other, and sometimes they're going to cuddle or hug. And you know that doesn't often happen with lizards, but we did often see where sometimes they just don't do anything. Um, and you expect them to do lap at each other. And this creates a lot of variation. And so one way we could eliminate this variation is using videos. Um, do, does a video representation of a green anole accurately mimic a live representation of that green anole? And more specifically, how does this happen in the brain? So we do have um, other papers here, I have them cited, that show that there is no difference in behavior between how lizards respond to a video representation versus a live representation, but we don't have any evidence in how this, this information is being processed in the brain. And so why are we using green anoles? Well, first of all, they're highly visual. They are behaving, communicating all of the time. Um, and for those of you who don't know anything about lizards, um, Miguel may have explained some of this to you, but I'm going to go ahead and repeat. They, they push up and they do lap. So they have this really colorful throat fan um, that they show off to either uh, an aggressor or to a female that they're trying to court. They also have frequent social behavior. So just like I said, anytime there's a male, they're going to communicate somehow. Anytime there's a female, they're going to communicate. We also have a wealth of behavioral information on them. They have been highly their, their behaviors have been highly studied, and this allows us to have a better understanding of what it is that we're seeing in the lab. And if we're looking at the processing in the brain, we really need a brain atlas in order to know where those brain regions are that we want to focus on. And so what is one of the problems that can happen with videos? Well, this is just one of many examples. Um, on the right, we have an image from Jacobs showing that green anoles, they see visible light and UV light. So those are the two different lines. And on the right, we have an, uh, a study from Neil and Wade who show that green anole dewlaps also reflect visible and UV light. And so green anoles are seeing UV light and reflecting UV light. And this doesn't come across in videos. So again, like I said, this is, this is just one of the things that videos might just not make the cut for. And so if we're going to look at neural processing, and I apologize for my arrows. Um, this was better in the first version. Um, um, we, we need to understand, what, well, what do we already know about the visual and social pathways? So these are the visual pathways in the reptilian brain. Um, the image is going to start in the retina, it's going to project to the optic tectum, then it will project to the thalamus, which includes the lateral geniculate nucleus and the nucleus rotundus, and then it'll project to areas of the forebrain. And the two that I decided to focus on in my study are the lateral geniculate nucleus and the nucleus rotundus, because we, have, we do have studies on them, they are better known, and they are easy to identify with a brain atlas. And so socially, this is the social behavior network. This is for all vertebrates. Um, and there are six regions of the social behavior network. The extended medial amygdala, lateral septum, ventral medial hypothalamus, anterior hypothalamus, midbrain, and the region that I am focusing on, the preoptic area. Um, for very similar reasons, this is a region that has been studied in green anoles, and we have, it's very easily identifiable with the brain atlas. And putting these two together, is there a connection between the two in reptiles? And a study by Grotto et al. found that yes, there is a connection between the nucleus rotundus and the extended medial amygdala that will connect these two pathways. And so if there's a connection, does this also mean that activity in the visual pathways and in the social pathways are going to change simultaneously. So for example, if activity in the nucleus rotundus is greater, is activity in the preoptic area going to be greater? So just as a summary, the brain nuclei that I am focusing on are the two visual nuclei, the lateral geniculonucleus, nucleus, often known as the LGN, and the nucleus rotundus, often known as the NROT, 
and the social one, the preoptic area, often known as the POA. And for your reference, this is what they would look like. Um, this is a nissle stained section of a green anole. So what are we trying to find? Well, first of all, I predict that lizards receiving the most social information will also exhibit the greatest level of behavioral response. Visual and social nuclei in the lizard brain will have a greater level of activity when they're exposed to more visual and social information. And neuronal activity of visual and social nuclei will also be associated with the level of behavioral response of the lizard. So how did we study this? First, we had to put lizards in a box and have them watch videos. <laughs> so this is an example of our behavioral arena. Um, we constructed this by cutting out the holes and painting the exterior of the box in white. And just for your knowledge, um, we had two GoPros here so that we could look into the box and we could record um, the lizards behaving without actually interfering with the study by having our presence there. Um, we also have this iPad here to play the video, and the videos were produced in collaboration with Miguel Weber here and uh, Charlie Stein. And we have a lizard loosely tethered to a perch, so they were able to move around, even though this one looks like he's really hugging <laughs> the perch. And so we had four conditions total. Um, our first condition was, without the video, two lizards together, and each um, condition had 10 minutes of acclimation period where the lizards couldn't see each other and 15 minutes of the trial. And just so you know, it's a little bit of an awkward angle, but they are at the same height. The next condition is the anole video condition. Again, 10 minutes acclimation, 15 minute trial, and this is the video. Um, and I am going to see if it works. Oh, it doesn't work. Okay, that's okay. The, the anole would have been dewlapping. Um, and it was a 40 second dewlap followed by 20 seconds of the lizard just still and that looped for 15 minutes. The third condition is a scrambled video condition. Um, we used a code in MATLAB written by Charlie Stein where all of the pixels were scrambled so that the color integrity was maintained but the, the, the image of a lizard was gone. And our final condition was our control condition where we just had this perch. There was no change in what, what the lizard was seeing. It was just this perch maintained for the whole 25 minutes. And so if we, for first we analyzed the behavior following the trial and then following the, well, before we analyzed the behavior, we um, had to collect the, the brain tissue and we froze it immediately within five minutes. And then in order to study the activity of each brain region, I sectioned each brain and um, where you, we used immediate early genes. So an immediate early gene is a gene that is one of the earliest transcribed when neurons are active. So basically you have neuronal activity, you have this um, FOS promoter, specifically the immediate early gene I was using is CFOS. So you have the FOS promoter and we get the FOS protein. And if we can quantify the levels of this FOS protein in each neuron, we can quantify the activity of that brain region. And so how do we quantify the levels of the protein? We use immunocytochemistry. So in this technique, we have a primary antibody that binds to our protein, in this case CFOS, a secondary antibody with a fluorescent tag that binds to our primary antibody, and then we can measure the levels of fluorescence using confocal imaging, and then we can analyze the images and quantify the level of fluorescence using image J. So this is an example of the lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, the blue circles are DAPI, and DAPI binds to DNA so that we only see the nuclei. And the red is the CFOS. And um, we ran this through image J using a macro written by Dr. Bodwin and Miguel Weber, who has been incremental in my entire project. Um, and so what the macro did was it took the circles of DAPI, so the nuclei, and it measured all of the red inside those circles. And also with immunocytochemistry, we have to run controls to ensure that our antibodies aren't having any nonspecific binding. And so the first control you see is a no primary control where we just left the primary out, put the secondary, saw if the secondary had any signal. As we can see, there's no signal, which is what we expect and want. Um, we have a preabsorption control where we 
added 20 molar um, excess of CFOS protein with the primary antibody before adding it onto the tissue. So theoretically, the primary antibody will bind to the CFOS protein and all of the primary antibody will be taken up. And when you wash, wash your um, antibody and CFOS protein off, the, all of the primary antibody should go with it without ever binding to any of the CFOS on the tissue. And as expected, we don't see very much red. And then just to, for reference, the experimental condition. So what did I find? Um, I'm going to start off by explaining my behavioral findings and then go into the neural and some of the neural correlated with the behavioral findings. So first of all, I have this measure proportion of the trial that they had their eye tilted towards the screen. I call this attentiveness. In my previous version, I had it as attentiveness. Um, and so we see that any time the lizards had some sort of extra visual stimulus, they were attentive for most of the proportion of the trial, and the control was significantly less attentive than the rest. So it didn't really care about this nothing happening in front of it. <laughs> Next, we have number of push-ups. Um, and so the scrambled video and the control video, they did not push up at all. So when I ran these analyses, it was only comparing the live anole and the anole video condition. And there were no significant differences between the live anole and anole video condition. So we, we see the same thing that previous findings have found where there, there's no significant difference between the, the live anole and the video version of the anole. And we find the same thing with number of dewlaps. Um, I would like to mention that with the scrambled video, previously, if you remember, we found nothing. Here we had a few dewlaps. Um, so we believe that, well, whenever a, an anole dewlaps without push-ups, this is not considered a social display. It's called an assertive display. It's basically something if, if they're alone and they're just kind of in the wilderness and they're just, they just dewlap, they're like, hey, I'm here. Like, <laughs> um, so they're not dewlapping at some sort of social stimulus. They're just kind of doing it because... So our first hypothesis um, is correct. Lizards receiving the most social information exhibit the strongest behavioral responses. So moving on to the neural findings, um, just as a reminder, in the POA we expected activity to be greater um, with greater exposure to visual and social stimuli, and we actually see the opposite. So the live anole condition has the lowest POA activity. Um, and integrated density here on the on the y-axis, that is just the measure of CFOS in each neuron. So it's basically just activity in the POA. And then when we correlated, um, when we tested for a correlation between attentiveness and POA activity, um, in the live and null condition specifically, we saw this um, strong effect but marginally significant negative correlation between attentiveness and the activity in the POA. And we did not find this result in any other condition, only in the live and old condition. Now looking at the visual re brain regions, so just serves a reminder, the nucleus rotundus and the LGNRR visual brain regions. So here we have nucleus rotundus activity, and there were no significant differences between any of these conditions. And the same thing with the uh, lateral geniculate nucleus, there were no significant differences. And when we correlated nucleus rotundus activity with LGN, con LGN activity, we found a strongly significant correlation between the two. So our second hypothesis, do visual and social nuclei in the brain, are they going to be more active if they're exposed to more visual and social information? No, but we do see that POA activity and exposure to the live and all were inversely related, and that activity in the visual nuclei did not differ between conditions. In our third hypothesis, um, neuronal activation of visual and social nuclei, will they be associated with behavioral responses? Yes, but not really in the way that we expected. So as often happens in research, um, your data doesn't always tell you what you want to hear, but it can still tell you some pretty cool things. So the first major finding I want to share with you all um, is that from this we can gather that the POA in reptiles, or at least green anoles is likely inhibitory. So this is, these are just pictures of my results from before showing that the live anole condition had the lowest POA activity and we have this negative correlation between attentiveness and POA activity. And this is a graph from a study by Neil and Wade showing levels of CFOS correlated with dewlap extensions and the greater levels of CFOS, so the greater activity in the POA, the lower number of dewlap extensions. So 
This may be, so this was seen also in green anoles, and so my study may be the second to show that the POA may be inhibitory in reptiles, at least green anoles. And this is something that we see in mammals, um, just not really in, it hasn't really been studied very much in reptiles. The second major finding I want to share with you all is that while there is this connection that we see from Garado et al., that does not mean that the information processing between the connected um, brain regions is going to be the same. So this is something that we see sometimes in humans with the visual and social pathways that, for example, if you show a person a picture of their mom versus a picture of a stranger, um, they're going to have greater activity in the visual nuclei when seeing a picture of their mom. But we don't see that in reptiles. Um, when shown a picture of a live anole versus a picture of a perch, they don't really care. <laughs> um, they're just processing the images. And finally, do videos accurately mimic live interactions? Um, we do see that behaviorally there, there is no difference, just as the previous studies have shown, but neurally there may be a difference here. Um, I don't think this completely discounts the use of video, but I think it shows that we need to use caution and better study how to optimize video for trying to study animal behaviors and these nuances in the behaviors that animals produce. So with that, I would like to acknowledge Sigma Xi, NSF, Trinity University, and um, Dr. Star Carey and Sandra Carey from Carey Wildlife Preserve for funding. And then I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Johnson, who's been an incredible mentor, um, Dr. James Roberts, who's on my committee, Dr. Bowden and Dr. King for helping on the confocal, um, Miguel Weber, Brittany Ivanov, who have been helpful in every step of the way. <laughs> um, Charlie Stein, who helps with the code for scrambling the video, and the entire Johnson Lizard Lab for supporting me in the trials, catching lizards, and analyzing behavioral data. And with that, I will take questions. in response to like potential mates and also perhaps intruders or other males or something, right? Yes. Was there any sort of distinction in those behaviors? Like was it in conjunction with the push-ups or was it just kind of like, I have a lot of testosterone, so you should mate with me. I have a lot of testosterone, I can fight you. So are you talking about in my study or just in general? Just in general. Just, just in general. general. So um, we do see kind of nuanced differences between how they do lap when it's a predator versus how they do lap when it's like another green and all encroaching upon their territory versus when they're trying to do lap to court a female. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of those tiny differences, I could not tell you yeah. what they are. But yes, they do show small differences and that's part of, part of the hard thing about studying them is you never know exactly like who they're do lapping at. Um, you can't always identify that. Um, you can't always identify why they're do lapping. Um, and so that's what video would help, is if, okay, well, we're giving them this controlled situation where the only thing, social thing they could be dewlapping at is this lizard. And can we identify more about those nuanced little behaviors that they're presenting? Perfect. Okay. Um, I wasn't sure if you said this, but were all of the lizards, were they all male? Or were they, they, they were all male. Yes. I did not say that. Um, <laughs> I should have. And so, like, is there a difference that you would be able to tell, like, <coughs> Uh, you mean in the live versus live lizard? Yeah. Yes. So we quantified, and none of the lizards were different in terms of size of their body and head size. Um, so that is something we controlled for uh, because that's important. Yes, they shouldn't be different in size or else there will be differences in how they're behaving. And then did you use the same lizard as the one that you would introduce every time, or did you have some kind of system of like randomly? It was random, it was random, yeah. Sort of way, way beyond your study, which already had enough variables in it. But is there any data in the literature about background illumination changing the intensity of any of these behaviors? Because that would be another way to get at you know, enhancing or diminishing 
part of the wizard visual system uh, based on what of what the available light was. Yeah, so light conditions possibly in the environment. Yes, yes there are studies uh, looking at light conditions in the environment and whether or not there are differences in how they behave. Um, and from what I recall from that study, there weren't really differences in terms of the light conditions. Um, I think it was mostly the uh, ecomorph that they were in where there are differences. What were the lizards in the video doing? Were they dewlapping the whole time? or? Yes, so it was 40 seconds of dewlapping and push-upping and then 20 seconds where the lizard was just staring. So I, I wanted to show you the video, but it wasn't working with um, Google Docs. Um, so but yes, so they were dewlapping and push-upping simultaneously, and then it was 20 seconds of just staring. So it wasn't constant dewlapping the whole time. Okay, so sometimes. Yeah, there was a little bit of break. Um, 